user types yahoo.com into a browser. The browser translates www.yahoo.com into an IP address and tries to open a TCP connection. You did study TCP at some length, right? Yes? OK. <laughs> I think it was the some length thing. That um, once the connection is established, the browser sends the following byte stream, get space slash space HTTP 1.0. So the get indicates that you want to get a file. The web, remember, was when I say file, you should always translate in, there, in that, that in your mind to potentially uh, the operation of a script. But the web, as initially conceived, was um, you know, mostly used for transferring around static files. So you were requesting a file name specified by a, a URI, Universal Resource Identifier. So in this case, slash means the root document on the server. And then you tell it what protocol version you're using. So this is actually a nice little trick here whereby um, browsers and servers of different vintages can talk to each other. So the browser is saying, hey, I'm an old browser. I like HTTP 1.0, even though the world's moved on to HTTP 1.1. So give me the document back in HTTP 1.0. Then two carriage returns. So the browser actually can send that request and additional headers if it wants with optional information. And it indicates that it's done with its request by putting in two uh, actually, carriage return line feeds. OK. So Yahoo is then going to respond with a set of headers indicating which protocol is actually being used, whether or not the file requested was found, how many bytes the browser can expect, and um, what kind of information is contained in the file. This is called the MIME type. So the MIME type says this is plain text, or this is a JPEG uh, picture or this is uh, uh, MP3 audio file. Yahoo server is going to separate the headers, which are all text, with a blank line from the actual content, which may be you know, a bit stream of uh, music or something. And then Yahoo finally, in this case, is going to send its index page. And then the TCP connection is closed when the file has been received by the browser. I believe the protocol says that um, Either, either side can close the uh, TCP connection. That the, the browser can close it if it thinks it's sucked up all the bytes, or the server can close it if it thinks uh, sent them all. OK. You'll want to do this this term. You can try this yourself from an operating system shell. You don't need a web browser. Because it uses TCP, you can actually use the telnet command to open a uh, connection to a web server. So you say telnet, and then you type www.yahoo.com space port 80. If you don't give the optional argument of port 80, um, TCP, remember, uh, you're specifying the IP address of which computer you're going to. But you, if you don't tell it what port number, there's different so-called, did you study well-known ports in the systems course? Yeah, OK. So basically, if you don't give it the well-known port, if you don't give it 80, which is the well-known port number for web, um, and that's what your browser defaults to. Uh, unless you've typed, you know, www.yahoo.com colon, you know, 736 or whatever, um, then the browser, then Telnet is going to default to the ancient, uh, well-known port number for login, which I guess is 22 or 23 or something. And of course, Yahoo probably isn't going to allow unsecure, unencrypted shell logins on its web servers. A, B, you probably don't have an account on Yahoo's Unix machines, so it's much better to remember to type 80. And then you just type get space slash space HTTP slash 1.0, carriage return, carriage return, and you will get back exactly what Yahoo would have sent to your Netscape or MSIE browser. So in this case, you can sort of see. Dan, can you pump up the um, fixed width font to something huge? OK, that's better, I guess. So I put, um, like I said, what you have to type in bold. It comes back saying, OK, here's your document. It's going to, I'm giving it to, I'm, I'm, I'm behaving according to HTTP slash 1.0, maybe as you requested, or maybe that's what it would have done anyway. This is the status code of 200. 200 is the status code, meaning I found your file, here it is. And in fact, it explains that by saying OK. 
That's its interpretation of the 200. Content length is 18385. That means this index page is going to be 18K bytes long. Content dash type is text slash HTML. This is what tells your browser whether to display some and render some HTML. Or uh, if it were you know, image slash JPEG, it would display the uh, bitstream as a JPEG. And then here's that blank line that I mentioned that separates headers from content. And now here's your content. I'm an HTML document. Here's my head. Here's the title, which is Yahoo Bang. Blah, blah, blah. I don't list all 18K bytes here. OK. Um, I link, for you guys who really like to know the details, uh, I link to the protocol spec over at the W3C, the web consortium, which is housed uh, next door in five, 200 Technology Square, formerly 545 Technology Square, on the third floor. So actually, if you have questions, um, just walk over there and ask Tim. <laughs> Um, don't get lost in the details of the HTTP session. The point is that when it is over, it is over. Once you've gotten all those 18K bytes that you requested of the index page, the connection between you and Yahoo has been closed. If you want a sublink or some other uh, page, even sometimes inline images on the same page, those are new, as, the classic, as classically conceived, those are brand new HTTP requests. And as far as it's concerned, it could have come from anybody. OK, so this is fine for browsing Yahoo. What if you're shopping in Amazon? Um, what if you, uh, if you put something in your shopping cart, you want it to still be there 10 clicks later? What if you log into photo.net on click uh, 23, and on click 45, you're responding to a discussion forum posting? You don't want that interval of closed connections and reopened connections to result in photo.net not knowing who you are and uh, forcing you to log in again. OK, let's uh, scroll down, please. Um, so this is the challenge I was talking about earlier, creating a stateful user experience on tape of a stateless protocol. You have to ask yourself, where can you store state from request to request? Um, one thing you could do, the first and most obvious thing to do, is to say, well, my program is being torn down, and it's memory with it. But what I can do is I can write into a log file that Joe Smith requested Leo Buscaglia's bus nine to paradise. And then when Joe Smith connects again, I can just look up in the log file and see what's in his shopping cart. OK, the problem is that you run into is that HTTP is anonymous. What does that mean? That means you don't know that it's Joe Smith. You only know the IP address of um, the requesting computer. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and you know the IP address of your peer. OK, well, what if that IP address, in some cases, it doesn't resolve at all? Right? Sometimes you do an NS lookup on an IP address, and you have no idea what it is. But let's say that the people on the other side are good administrators, and you find that it's Joe Smith's desktop.stanford.edu. In that case, I think your log file strategy might actually work pretty well. He can't move. He can't take his shopping cart with him and finish his session from home, but perhaps uh, that'll work just fine. What if, though, the IP address is resolved to cache-rro2.proxy.aol.com? OK, well, let me draw you an illustration. That's a real host name, and that comes from a photo.net file from a day or two ago. OK. Here's 28 million AOL users. They're on a private network. It used to be extremely private. In fact, they weren't using internet protocol at all. They would have, I guess it is, still is for quite a few of them, right? They have some custom protocol between uh, you know, their homes and the AOL servers and so forth. And then when they want to go out onto the public internet, they go through this huge rack of proxy servers. And that is going on the public internet over to oops, the photo.net box. So it's called cache. as an interesting performance optimization here. Um, because I guess the hope is that um, for each proxy server, let's say it pulls down the home page of the New York Times, 
um, and then 27 million more people request it, well, that page can just be served from the proxy server's cache directly instead of running up AOL, AOL's internet connection bill. And you know, maybe there's, there's actually cache control directives in the uh, HTTP standard where the New York Times can explain to AOL how long it's willing to have its homepage cached. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, the bad thing, as far as you're concerned, is that here's one of those, here's that machine. They have, of course, quite a few proxy servers for uh, 28 million people. So I know that it's this computer making the request to photo.net. The problem is that because it's stateless all the way down, the next time this particular, here's my user over here. The next time my user makes a request of my server, it could come from a different physical machine within the same cloud with a different IP address. So the next request from that same user will probably come from a different IP address. And in fact, the next request from that same IP address will probably be from a different user. It'll be from someone else within this cloud of 28 million AOL customers. So that logging approach doesn't work because of the anonymity. As an engineer, you are forced to write some information out to that specific user's machine that will then come back on the next request, next time he or she clicks. Okay, so how do you do this? Dan, let's, uh, I'll show you this. So take a look carefully at this URL. It's amazon.com, blah, 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 slash the book ISBN number with the trailing slash and no other numbers. It only has one number in here, which is the ISBN of the book. Click on that if you would. Okay, we got redirected. I'll use this as a pointer. We got redirected, and notice, here's that ISBN of our book, but here's this huge sort of number that's been tacked on, 107-21, blah, 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 blah. I think this is a session ID. So it is actually saying this is this one particular user's session, and that gives me a way to identify that the next request is coming from the same person, you might say, how? Dan, do me a favor, please roll the mouse over, just roll the mouse over here. Okay, now we look down here at the uh, bottom of the screen. And on the bottom of the screen, you can see that the, um, you can see that any hyperlink on this page has been rewritten by the server to be customized for you. In other words, this HTML in every hyperlink includes that session ID at the end. Okay, uh, let's go back if you please. So let's scroll down a bit. Okay, so how do we extend this approach? What if you've got three books in your shopping cart? Um, well, all Amazon would have to do to preserve that state is continue its rewriting. So instead of just having that one number at the end, it could actually include the ISBN separated by slashes of all the books in your cart. And you might say, well, how long can this continue? Um, the HTTP, T, HTTP protocol does not place any a priori limit on the length of a URI. Hey, servers must be able to handle the URI of any resource they serve. So that's Amazon, so that's up to Amazon. If they keep serving big, long URLs, then uh, they have to be able to handle big, long URLs, but they don't have to be able to, there's no limit on this, URIs, I should say. Um, they should be able to handle URIs of unbounded length if they provide get-based forms that could generate such URIs. And uh, those hyperlinks that you follow by standard are get-based forms. A server should return 414 request URI to long status if a URI is longer than the server can handle. Okay, so I think we've got our implementation now. All we have to do is take any state that we need to remember during a session and just keep rewriting it into the HTML ad infinitum. If we have, if the user puts a thousand books in his shopping cart and an ISBN is um, 10 characters long, we'll have 10K byte long URLs to follow for the browser. I think it might actually work, except there's this comment from the HTTP spec. It might be a little bit slow because now if your page has, say, 100 hyperlinks on it, you have um, 
just uh, added, you just bulk up your page by about a megabyte of extraneous stuff because each hyperlink has to contain the complete state of the session. Servers, this is from the HTTP spec. Servers ought to be cautious about depending on URI links above 255 bytes because some older client or proxy implementations might not properly support these links. All right, so it appears that as engineers, this is maybe not the best approach. Scroll down a bit. Cookies. This is another idea. What about instead of rewriting our HTML and all the links, there's this extension that Netscape developed in 1994 called Cookies, a general mechanism which server-side connections such as CGI scripts can use to both store and retrieve information on the client side of the connection. The addition of a simple persistent client side state significantly extends the capabilities of web-based client server apps. How does it work? Scroll down a bit, please. After Joe Smith adds a book to his shopping cart, the server writes set cookie, and the name of the cookie is cart contents, and here's the ISBN that fills the cart contents and path equals slash. So this is one of the headers. We saw those headers sent with an HTTP, HTTP response. Well, here's a header to set cookie. Okay, that path equals slash says that on any URI that starts with a slash, going back to the same server, the browser is required to add a header giving back whatever it has been given so far. So now the browser on every subsequent request has to say, hey, my cart contents equals this number. So this would seem to be that it gets rid of, if your page has 100 hyperlinks on it, this actually cuts down on the amount of duplicate information. This, can't, this gets rid of 99 dupes. At least all you're doing is um, send, sending, setting it to the browser once, and the browser is giving it back to you on each page request. It's still slowing you down if you have a big shopping cart. You know. I hope, how great distributed databases are. People say, oh, Oracle really sucks. You don't want to have all your data on one computer. You want to have, because one big computer is really expensive. You want to have your data on lots of little computers spread all over the world. Well, guess what? With cookies, that's what you just did. You have a 1,000 users. Each user has a shopping cart. That shopping cart's in a cookie. You know, you got, you've achieved uh, computer science nirvana. You have a distributed database with a 1,000 um, nodes, each one of which holds a small amount of information. And the best thing of all is you didn't have to pay for any of it. You didn't have to pay for the hard disk drive that it consumes, if any. Let's scroll down a bit. Um, a deeper problem with cookies, though, um, well, there's a couple of problems with cookies. One, they can't hold too much. The spec limits you to 4K bytes per cookie. Um, and you can only have 20 cookies per server. So you're only entitled to store about 80K bytes on the user's machine, <coughs> which might not be enough for certain kinds of complex applications. A deeper problem is they aren't portable for the user. So if Joe builds up a cart at work and then wants to check out after maybe showing it to um, you know, somebody in his family at home, uh, then he can't do it. He can't retrieve his session or his shopping cart because it's all kept uh, on the hard drive or in the memory of his computer at work. Uh, a final problem with cookies is that users disable them because of some privacy problems, which I'm going to encourage you to follow this hyperlink and read here in user tracking, uh, where basically um, you can get a page from uh, one server and a banner ad from another server, and the banner ad can give your browser a cookie. Uh, so you think you're surfing NewYorkTimes.com, but you're actually getting a cookie from the DoubleClick network. Uh, and the DoubleClick and the New York Times are communicating behind your back so they can figure out, okay, this is uh, you know, Philip Greenspun because uh, you're registered to the NewYorkTimes.com, right? It's a registration required site. And then if I go to a porn site and they're also getting ads from DoubleClick.com, I think, okay, I'm surfing this porn site, but nobody knows how naughty I am. Well, if I'm getting ads from DoubleClick, then my browser, when it requests the ad from DoubleClick, is giving it its is uh, supplying its DoubleClick ID cookie. And DoubleClick, oh, okay, well, that's the same ID that I got when Philip Greenspan was surfing the New York Times. So now I'm on the you know, list of porn consumers. All right. Um, 
So the previous solution doesn't work between sessions anyway, right? I mean, the previous... Uh, you, you actually want to see that in a second. <laughs> There's a way to make the cookies persistent. So if we tell them that, here, here's an approach where we, instead of using, we do use cookies, but instead of using them to hold the, hold the whole shopping cart, we use them only to hold a pointer to the shopping cart, and we're going to keep the state on the server side. So you can try this out. You tell them that to photo.net port 80, then you get the index page, and you'll see in the response before everything else starts scrolling by, HTTP 1.0, 200 OK, MIME version 1.0, content type text slash HTML, two set cookie headers, one for AD browser ID, and here's a number, path equals slash. Uh, can you scroll to si sideways, Dan, please? Expires Friday, January 1st, 2010 at 1 a.m. GMT. So that basically tells the browser, okay, this is a cookie that you should be giving back to me on every page load, but don't stop giving it back to me when you quit the browser and restart. Store this information somewhere persistently, presumably in this day and age that's going to be on a local hard drive, uh, cookies file. I'm sure you can find that on your own machine quite easily. Um, and uh, also take this session ID, another second cookie with a different name, 80 session ID. That's got a different number. Can you scroll to the right, Dan, please? That's also got a path equals slash, so on every page load, but it's got a max age equals 3600. If we, if we left off the age, it would go for as long as the user kept the browser open. In this case, we can make it time out after uh, one hour, I guess, because we want to say that if the user leaves his browser idle for a while and comes back after an hour, that's a new session. Okay. Uh, scroll down, please. Uh, why do we have this? Okay, the browser cookie, I think, is good for, you know, I prefer text only, even if the user never registers. Presumably, their preference for text only is maybe related to the speed of their connection. So that's a good place to store things like that, because that's not going to change, even if a different person comes up and uses the machine. The second cookie, the session ID, um, you know, good for uh, e-commerce, for shopping carts and so forth. Photo.net, uh, if you do use it for e-commerce, don't make it expire after an hour, because, of course, it'd be pretty annoying to build up your shopping cart, wait till your friend comes home to give you approval and then have it say that it's expired. Broadvision does that. There's this toolkit from Broadvision, uh, which is a bit similar to our Zigida community system. Um, and uh, one of the user experience things that it imposes by default uh, is an expiring session. So any Broadvision back site is torture to use because in practice, I don't think, I think it's probably settable, but people don't. Uh, in fact, you know, just to the point where you're ready to check out and you've decided you want the things that you built up, it'll say, oh, your session's expired. You have to start over. Okay. Um, yeah, if you were logged into photo.net, keep in mind there would also be a user ID cookie as well. There'd be a third one uh, saying who the user is. Server-side storage. You've got ID information going out to and coming back from the browsers, either via the cookie extension to HTTP or via URL rewriting in the Amazon case. Amazon, you know, is not keeping your shopping cart uh, in those URLs. They don't get longer and longer. They're just keeping the session ID, and they're keeping the cart information back there on their server farm. Um, you're going to want to keep the information in a structured form. So you want to have you know, a nice table, like a spreadsheet, of all the items put into the shopping cart by various users, another table of orders, table of user-contributed product reviews. Um, so now you have to ask yourself, what's a good tool for me to store my tables? Okay. Well, if you've been a good desktop computer user, you think, okay, a spreadsheet's a good tool. I like using, you know, Star Office Calc. Uh, I like using Microsoft Excel. So that's what I'll use for my web server. Well, the problem with those tools is they're intended for one user at a time. That's why they have a mouse and a keyboard interface. All they have to do is watch the mouse and the keyboard, and they know that they're going to be able to handle all the input that a user could give them. As far as output goes, all they have to do is output to the screen. Um, scroll down a bit, please. On the web, fundamentally, you have potentially thousands of simultaneous users putting information into the uh, database tables and taking them out. And that is the problem that database management systems, or DBMS, were intended to solve. So I'm going to give you this um, 
way of thinking about database management systems. You basically have to think of the closet. Um, so basically, you think of this spreadsheet program that goes into a closet and shuts the door. <laughs> OK, so your database management system, imagine Microsoft Excel um, or Star Office Calc is sitting in there in the closet. OK, so now it's in the dark. We can't get to it. We can't get to the mouse. We can't get to the keyboard. Uh, we can't see the display. So how do we interact with it? Well, we say, OK, I want you to create me a new table of, uh, say, which users have ordered what. And you slide that request underneath the door. And then you say, OK, now I'd like to add uh, a row to that table saying that user number 37 ordered uh, Leo Buscaglia's bus 9 to paradise. You slide that under the door. Um, and when you want to get your information back out, you say, OK, please show me all the orders from the last day. And you slide that request under the door. And your spreadsheet in the closet writes down a report and shoves it back under the door where you can read it. So that is, I don't think that's how the Oracle marketing guys would describe Oracle. But that's what it is. Oracle is Microsoft Excel sitting by itself in a dark closet, waiting for little strips of paper to be uh, slid under the door. Um, OK, notice that this solves the concurrency problem. Instead of having 1,000 users fighting over the same mouse and the keyboard, <coughs> all that you have to keep in track of is in what order those strips of paper arrived in front of the door. And if the two come in at the same time, you can resynchronize them into some arbitrary order. It doesn't really matter. And then processes them in that order. So that lets you deal with the problem like you only have one airline seat left to sell, and 1,000 people requested it. So you just arrange their strips of paper requesting an insertion of an order for that airline seat. You take the first one, you hand back a confirmation, and then you take the next 999, and you slide error messages back under the door in response. OK, let's uh, scroll down. I'm going to, you have to pick a DBMS this semester to use, or this, I don't know what we call this, this month. Um, how do you know if it's good enough? How do you know if it can handle the challenges of 6916? Um, IBM proposed the ACID test in the 1960s, actually before the relational database management system came out. And uh, they said you need atomicity, that's the A, consistency, isolation, and durability. So atomicity, let's consider user registration, because that's what you'll be doing um, pretty soon. So let's suppose you have a user who registers with her name, her address, and her portrait. So three items, and they're stored in a three separate table. Your name's table, your address's table, and your portrait's table. Atomicity says that you can instruct the database to have those three inserts be treated atomically. If well, Suppose the hard disk drive is large enough to handle the name and the address insertion, but putting the, trying to put the portrait in results in the disk drive filling up, because maybe it's a four megabyte portrait. Well, in that case, um, you have a, if you have, a, if you have uh, yoked them together as in a transaction, the database management system will roll the entire, all the changes back to those other two tables, even though they were successful. And it won't leave you with a broken database where you have portraits for some users and not others. Consistency, the database is transformed from one valid state to another state. You can specify a rule that says, all my discussion forum postings are tied to a user ID. So I know that user number 37 contributed um, you know, this comment uh, on another user's question. OK. Um, consistency lets you specify a rule saying that if user number 37 is in the discussion forums table as the author of a posting, that there must actually be a user number 37 in the user's table. So this keeps you from inserting garbage into your tables if you somehow screw up and you, know, you have a novice programmer who posits fictitious users. More interestingly, it keeps you from um, deleting a user by mistake. So let's say a pro you hire a new programmer and you say, hey, user number 37 doesn't like the service anymore. He wants to desubscribe, so just delete him from the user's table. Well, if you deleted it from, if, if the database management system actually authorized the delete and did it, you'd be left with orphan data in the discussion forum posting. You'd be left with 
you know, a response to somebody's question and, and you wouldn't have a name associated with it. You'd have, you know, user number 37 uh, and you wouldn't know who that was. Okay. So you got protection against those kind of mistakes. Isolation. Isolation is only interesting because you have more than one person at a time dealing with the database. Um, you may have a thousand users all working side by side at the closet door. Go over the closet again. Okay, so you have one user registering, and she's saying, put my name into the names table, put my address into the address table, put my portrait into the portraits table. Here's another user getting a web page. And his web page is supposed to show all the users with their portraits right next to them. Well, what if he has the bad luck to start his query about halfway through uh, Jane's registration process? Should he see, uh, you know, Joe Smith picture, uh, you know, I don't know, Anita Bimbo picture, uh, Joe MBA picture, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't think so, because um, he, uh, well, what, what about this partially finished re record here? So there's Jane, and, um, you know, there's her name, there's her address, uh, but her picture's going to be all broken because only half of it's gone in. So isolation says... The results of the transaction are invisible to other transactions until the transaction is complete. Um, that means that until Jane is completely finished registering and her portrait's in the database, that uh, nobody else can see any of those changes, not to the names and not to the addresses table. Okay, durability. So suppose you have, you know, some really sloppy. Uh, sysadmin types hanging around your machine room and they're all drinking Diet Coke and uh, you know so let's say that uh, Joe Sloppy knocks his Diet Coke into the server and fries a disk drive. Durability says you can recover all the committed transactions. Um, now that's an artifact of hardware as well as software and how the software uses the hardware. Um, it's not going to be achievable on a computer with one disk. Okay. Why the relational database management system? I don't want to keep people too long. I guess we're not that far into it. Um, the basic idea, uh, this term, unless somebody is an expert on RDBMS already and says, I hate RDBMSs, I hate SQL, we're going to ask everybody to use a real RDBMS. And the reason that they have taken over the world is you give you a declarative programming language. And as we discussed in this chapter, um, it adds a lot of power for uh, experienced programmers to write code that's uh, less buggy than traditional code. I don't know how many of you had any bugs in the Java code that you wrote during uh, January. Was it January? Yeah. But uh, you may have had a few. Um, and uh, SQL will let professional programmers like yourselves write code with fewer bugs. The, also, the other interesting thing about declarative computer languages is they let non-programmers write fairly substantial programs. The evidence for that being the spreadsheet, where people who don't even think of themselves as programmers, because they can say things like, make this cell the sum of these other 17 cells, are able to write substantial applications with help from uh, professionally educated programmers. So that's the first pillar of our DBMS popularity. The second pillar is isolation of important data from programmers' mistakes. So as you study the SQL language, and you are, a good way to spend a day is to read SQL for Web Nerds um, and play around with the Oracle exercises at the bottom of this uh, chapter. Um, you'll find that there's not much you can say. Your speech is restricted. In other words, if you're writing a C or a Lisp program or a Java program, um, with C, you have total freedom to do whatever you want. You can write any location in your address space. With Lisp and Java, you can't directly, you know, peek and poke at the uh, machine addresses, but you can still do a fair amount of violence to uh, somebody else's data structures. Um, with a database, all you can do is say, Give me, create a table for me, insert a row, update a value, delete a row. Uh, your speech is limited, and therefore, you're probably less likely to have bugs. The second thing is 
those strips have applications names on them and sometimes programmers names on them. So if something's gone horribly wrong, if you open up the closet and you find a big mess, um, you can actually unroll all those strips of paper and see who was responsible <laughs> for creating that mess. Um, and then go and uh, reform the offenders. You can fix the programs. You can uh, send some of your programmers back to school. That's true, although I think some object databases also have logging. But yeah, uh, there's also um, point in time recovery where you can say, I want to get back to where my data database was the instant before this particular strip of paper went in. The third and final pillar of RDMS popularity is that the commercial implementations happen to have become very good at dealing with a 1,000 users at once. So then there's some, I guess I will talk about this a little bit. What you're really learning in this course are these four steps. Develop a data model, figure out what the legal transactions to that data model are, develop an interaction, a page flow design that gets people led up to those data models, and then implement the individual pages. So it turns out that when you're choosing tools, you pretty much have to use an RDBMS for uh, these two steps. Everybody uses a relational database management system these days. Page flow and interaction design. Interaction design is a purely abstract process that you could do with a pencil and paper. Implementing the individual pages is a trivial step. If you've done the first three things correctly, you'll have a good application, and the user won't care what it's implemented in. It could be Kodak, uh, COBOL, it could be EDSAC machine code. The user does not care. Um, but you look at what two web programmers are arguing about, and oftentimes it's, I like Perl, I like Visual Basic, and they're hitting each other. You know, you should really be using Java. Um, well, if the user can't tell and doesn't care, why should you? Um, but you'll still have to choose. All right, HTML, there's an HTML tutorial in here which you ought to read if you don't already know HTML. Uh, we basically think that you ought to use Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, or PostgreSQL this term. So SQL Server is good if you expect to spend the rest of your life enslaved by Microsoft. Oracle is good because it's pretty popular on a wide variety of machines and it works really well. Postgres is good because it's open source. Um, they're all real RDBMSs. It's up to you pretty much. A lot of our source code examples are in Oracle. Uh, it's because that's what we've been using since 1994. Um, and we give you some reasons to choose among them. Okay, choosing an execution environment. We give you some things to look for. One URL equals one file. This is a critical thing. You don't want some huge monolithic, say, Java or Lisp program that uh, you know sits in maybe 100 different files and responds to, say, 2,000 different URLs. Uh, and you can't really figure out which file is responsible for which URL. You want something like Perl CGI or a Microsoft Active Server page or an AOL Server Tickle script, where if the user says, I don't like what I see at photo.net slash foobar, that you know I don't have to think about where that code is. I just go to slash web slash photo.net slash www. That's the web server root on the photo.net server. Slash foobar dot something. In the case of photo.net, it would probably be dot tickle or dot ADP. Um, and fix the problem. So one URL equals one file. Look for that. Filters are good. The TAs are going to be nosing around trying to figure out how to do filters in your various environments. With AOL Server, it's easy. You say NS register filter. Basically, it's an approach to managing security and also factoring out some common code. The one URL equals one file has the property that you may end up having 20 copies of some code. You can put it into a function, but then you at least have 20 copies of the function call, like to check for security access on some admin pages. With a filter, you can say, any URL that starts with slash admin, go and run this little piece of code. So now you only have that in one place, and you don't have to rely on your programmers of the admin pages to insert a security check. So look for that in your programming environment. Um, for example, with Perl CGI, I don't believe you get filters very easily. Abstract URLs. OK. So. When you're sitting there in step three on a clean sheet of paper saying, I want to have my discussion forum start with all topics, then go down to one topic, then go to one thread, and then go to post reply, then go to post reply confirm. Um, if um, you then implement in Java server pages, you say, great, I'm all 100% Java, Java, great, great, great. Should you have .jsps 
after those abstract URLs um, on your implemented service? Should the users see that you've chosen Java server pages? Um, in general, I think it's a bad idea to expose to anything, anything to the users that users don't need to know or care about. So by that rule, the .jsp is something they shouldn't see. Um, if you change your mind and you switch to Perl, are you then going to change it all to .pl? Well, now everybody's bookmarks are broken, and all the links that you sort of nurtured over the years from other people's sites to yours, now those are all broken also. So basically... There's no real reason to believe that 20 years from... I hope that Photo.net is around 20 years from now. There's not necessarily a reason to believe that Java server pages will be around 20 years from now or will be a preferred way of doing things 20 years from now. Um, so I think you want a web programming environment where you can publish these abstract URLs. And notice that a lot of the good sites these days are doing that, that basically uh, all you see is one thread. You don't know how they implemented the thing. They're free uh, from an abstraction point of view to change the way they implement their service. Um, you need something called a request processor, which takes an abstract URL and then digs around in the filing, file system looking for the most likely file to serve. So maybe it can start by looking for a .jsp file. If it doesn't find that, it can say, OK, um, well, is this a, did, the, did the request come in with headers requesting WML for a WAP device, Oracle and AOL server? So, um, I'd like to encourage you to, to use that, but I'm not sure that I can because basically um, just most people aren't that intelligent. And if they see that you're programming in Tickle, they'll say, oh, you're a Tickle programmer. So that's not a good thing to be or not a good thing for somebody to think that you are, and it kind of gets in the way. So uh, actually you can, write, you can write Java code and so forth in AOL server, but I, I think that's um, it's very productive, but I'm not sure it's the right thing. Um, socially. So the second choice is something like uh, Java and maybe Tomcat. Jin's actually been using uh, the Tomcat server all by itself. You don't actually need anything else. You just run Tomcat and it has its own HTTP listener built in so you don't need Tomcat and Apache or Tomcat and this. You just need Tomcat. And I guess he's had pretty good luck with it, right, for writing Java server pages. Um, so that's okay also. Um, how does it do on some of these other things? Have you figured out how to do abstract URLs with JSP, with Tomcat? Okay. Talk to Jin. He's the man. Um, and then the third option, which I think is in some ways the most interesting because we're going to be doing a lot of distributed computing and server-to-server -server communication, is Microsoft.net. Uh, it has, I think, a lot of the characteristics that you'll see in other programming environments maybe five to ten years from now. It has a lot of support for these W3C standards that were originated by Microsoft, like Simple Object Access Protocol, or SOAP, which is a way for one web server to call a procedure on another web server, and Web Service Description Language, WSDL, which is a way for a web server to say, these are my interesting methods that other web servers can call. So basically, because this stuff started at Microsoft, um, they seem to have built support for it. I also think from a career point of view, um, again, if you, if you posit that you're not going to be being interviewed by somebody who's very bright, uh, it's good to have um, something like this under your belt and say, okay, well, I completely understand Microsoft.net because there's a lot of people who think that you know, they'd like to have somebody who knows about this stuff on their staff. Uh, we had students use Oracle and AOL server last term for their PSETs and Microsoft.net for their project. And at the end of the term, we asked them, you know, which they preferred, and they said that, that they, they didn't care, they were indifferent, they were both equally good. So um, that, to me, indicates that it's at least usable. There's going to be Microsoft. Microsoft uh, actually is sending us 40 machines, because I said I, didn't want, I was unwilling to disrupt uh, your computing environment. Um, so you'll have another machine that you can plug into your monitor and run Windows 2000 on and Microsoft.net. You'll have, they're sending a consultant from Canada, who's going to fly in. He's some like $200. Actually, you can see what it's like to be a $200 an hour Microsoft.net consultant, because there'll be this guy here uh, from Canada that Microsoft Research is paying an absurd fortune to uh, you know, answer all of your questions. And we're also hiring some of our students from last term to mill about and show you how to use .NET. So I think you'll have 
almost equal quality of support for .NET and AOL Server Oracle. If you want to use you know, Perl and Apache, don't ask me to read your code, because I don't like looking at my own Perl code, much less somebody else's. But um, you know, that's a perfectly acceptable way to get through these problem sets. Uh, so the rest of this chapter is devoted to this exercise, which is these exercises were intended to teach you how to log into your development server, uh, rudiments of SQL, um, querying the RDBMS, personalizing web service with cookies, publishing and reading XML. Oh, that's another thing for the TAs. You guys have to write, find XML parsers and deliver them to these guys. I obviously need a little HTML help myself. Is what this is basics. We're not giving numbers anymore. <laughs> this is problem set number one. It's in this chapter. Um, what I'm going to encourage you guys to do, for those of you who are still waiting on these uh, Windows boxes, uh, there is a whole bunch of DB exercises at the bottom that can be completely done without a web execution environment. So I would encourage you, if, if you feel like using Oracle this term, to just do these on your Linux machine in Oracle and then wait till tomorrow when you can start cranking away, uh, presumably in .NET, assuming the machines do show up today. Uh, the guy showing up with control? Tomorrow morning. I'll be here at 11 p.m. tonight on a flight. And But I, I, the, the, the bigger issue is the computers, because um, actually, you know, there are tens of thousands of people worldwide who have gotten .NET to work without uh, any Canadian help. Um, <laughs> so you could actually get some work done in theory, uh, without his help. But I don't think you can get any work done without uh, a Windows machine. Um, and actually, that's for those of you who are worried about becoming slaves to Microsoft forever, I don't think I would want to put you into that kind of position. Um, when Microsoft has something that's any good, like active server pages are a pretty good idea, um, usually if you wait a year or two, there is some way to use that same thing on Unix. So in the case of active server pages, for a year or two, you were restricted to Windows. Now you can actually interpret active server pages with something called ChiliSoft on any Unix machine. And I think it's going to happen the same way with .NET, that basically they're trying to standardize all the common runtime environment stuff, and there probably will be open source. Just like some, the same thing happened with some with J2EE. There, there were initially only commercial Java application servers, and now there's JBoss, and Tomcat, I guess, is kind of a degraded uh, simplified one, and then there's another one, Jonas. There's two full-featured open-source J2E application servers. So I think if you wait a couple of years, um, there'll be you know full Unix slash open-source implementations of the .NET stuff. Uh, but anyway, like I said, you don't have to. The course is not about. It's about user experience. It's about data model. It's about learning how to think about the application. Um, implementation is a detail. It's, you guys are mature enough as engineers to uh, live and die by your own uh, choices. So uh, we're not going to tell you that one thing is better than another because if the user can't tell what you're using underneath, then uh, there's no real reason to get religious about it. Um, so anyway, like I said, you do. The DB exercises at the bottom are more or less independent of the stuff at the top. If you don't use Oracle for these, you'll have to apply some imagination to the TA's will. In like PL SQL doesn't make sense in a non-Oracle world, but you know SQL Server and Postgres both have similar procedural extensions that run internally, so you could do the same thing. All right, uh, I guess I should take one or two questions and then let you guys go. Basic schedule here. Oh, that would be nice to have, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> the teaching software engineering page has like week by week by week, so this is supposed to be one week at MIT. Um, which means that, um, actually, this is supposed to be, pardon me, this is um, almost two weeks at MIT, so that's about one-seventh of the course. So in theory, this problem set should be done, you know, by Wednesday or Thursday. On the other hand, you know, if you have, at MIT, they didn't have to install their own Oracle. Uh, they didn't have to, uh, you know, plug in their own Windows machine. So I think that if everybody gets to the end of this in their programming environment by, uh, say, uh, Thursday night or Friday. I won't be too unhappy. But there is a lot more to do the rest of the term, so don't slack off too much. Uh, class times? Class times, I think, will be more or less what you see. We'll try to start lectures around 9.30 and go till about um, maybe uh, 11, usually. 
So, actually, that's a little different from today. Um, so 9.30 to 11 probably will be the classes. And then in the afternoon, Dan's going to do uh, code review sessions. What time are you going to do those? Um, usually one. Yeah, so the code review sessions will be interesting. First of all, it'll give you some incentive not to write really nasty code. Secondly, it'll give you exposure to other computing environments. So if you choose Microsoft.net and you want to see you know, what it's like in the Apache and Perl world, um, well, the 1 o'clock code review sessions will be your chance because you'll not only be seeing um, the user experience and talking about that, uh, but you'll also be seeing how other people have implemented the stuff under the hood. Basic work is the other exams or tests? I think we'll do it. We might, we might do. I think we'll, if, I get, if I get the energy, I'll do a couple of exams like we had at MIT, but they were trivial. They were like maybe an hour and a half for the first one and then two hours for the final. Um, it's basically because, well, most MIT students aren't very thoughtful. You, you know, I mean, you guys are older and you're more careful thinkers. A lot of MIT students, particularly by senior year, you know, they had four years of this crap. They don't want to do it anymore. They just want to do the minimum. So, you know, some of them, by the end of the term, it was amazing how little they thought about web applications. Uh, it was kind of funny. We did have, if you read in there, we had this one exam where they were supposed to go to uh, carnival.com and figure out if they had a cruise leaving on a particular day, and then they were trying, they're supposed to imagine they were gay and find a gay friendly cruise and see if carnival.com had gay friendly cruises. Um, and because it was impossible to figure out anything at this carnival site. So they're supposed to criticize the carnival <laughs> user experience. Um, and then I said, okay, now go over to planetout.com, which is run by a friend of mine, uh, this woman who's in the media lab and is on the MIT Corporation. So I was plugging her site. So I go to Planet and she just merged with gay.com. So I said, okay, go to planetout.com and try to figure it out over there on their search engine. Then go to the gay.com discussion forum, and I wanted them to compare the UI to photo.net. But I, I kept the same thing about trying to find a gay-friendly group. So I said, go to gay.com, click on the travel section. You know, I was trying to like, keep them out of any really potentially uh, worrisome areas of content. Um, so this one student who didn't speak English, it was a written final. Um, he really didn't speak English very well. He wrote down that, well, I went to gay.com and I typed cruising into the search engine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know if we'll do that one again. <laughs> Other questions? I don't think Microsoft wants, you know, 40 crummy Dell machines, so maybe you can take them home when you're done. We also want the chairs. I don't want the chairs. What? I don't want Can you put it in a closet if you hate Microsoft? Is that what you're asking? Can I wipe it and use it for something else? Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure to whom they belong, but, you know, as long as you don't chop it up with a hatchet. I used to hate Microsoft, too, actually, as you guys know. And then I realized, I mean, the reason I hated Microsoft, and I used to have all this content on my site about how much I hated Microsoft, um, I hated them because they were enormously rich, um, they hadn't innovated, and they didn't have any interesting ideas. So, um, so that was five years ago, and I, th I just changed it the other day, not, not, not because they're helping us with this course. Um, I changed it because I realized that looking back over the last year, you know, where did I get interesting ideas? And I found that about 20% of the interesting ideas that I'd gotten came from Microsoft. That they actually, the, the, the most interesting people in the world who are thinking about online community and putting metrics in on Usenet and thinking about what does it mean for somebody? How do you figure out whether somebody's a value member of the community? They all work at Microsoft Research. There are PhDs in sociology from UC Irvine, they work at Microsoft Research. If you look at web execution environments and web development environments, and you figure out, you know, who's gotten us beyond this, uh, uh, you know, okay, well, you either use this, you know, really complicated language like Java and, you know, call yourself macho and beat your chest for having string decorations all over the place. Uh, or you say, oh, you know, I use VB or Perl and I don't have to declare stuff and I'm productive. Uh, but, you know, and I have to apologize before the rest of the world because I, I program in Tickle and I don't have, you know, 400 string declarations to go with my 400 string variables. Um, you know, Microsoft actually moved us beyond that with .NET. You can, you know, you want to program in C Sharp, great. If you want to do something really complicated, you want to sit in Visual Basic and create a subclass of one of those C Sharp classes, you can actually do that. 
which I think is interesting. I don't know of any other language where you can do that, right? I can't create a whole big system in Java and then specialize that with Perl. I cannot create a subclass of a Java class uh, from Perl or from Common List for that matter. So uh, I sort of, I didn't like decide to toss my Microsoft hatred. I just stopped hating them. And I just thought, well, okay, well, you know, Linux has its own problems on the desktop. It doesn't seem to really work as a web browser uh, <laughs> for most of what I want to do. You know, Windows has its problems. But uh, anyway, so I'm not saying you should give up your Microsoft hatred. But I gave mine up because it just, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that what they've contributed to the world of interesting ideas was, you know, worth like the $400 billion that we had to give them. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, yet anyway, but hey, it's just $400 billion and um, I don't know, a lot of money was given to all these sort of useless dot coms in Silicon Valley that we won't even remember their names a few years from now, much less any ideas that we got from them. Petstore.com, they went through $150 million and I couldn't even order an, uh, and a little acrylic aquarium from them that I wanted. Because <laughs> the software was broken for a whole month, and I called their 800 number, and they said, oh, like, all of our ordering pages are broken, too. And <laughs> so, you know, on that scale, I think Microsoft actually doesn't come off too bad. So, all right, are we done?